Hi, I'm Larry Dapsis. I'm the entomologist with Cape Cod Cooperative Extension. And in this segment, we're going to look at the basic identification characteristics for the three principal ticks that you might encounter here on Cape Cod or for southeastern Massachusetts in general. Uh, first of all, we have the good old American dog tick. And for people in the baby boomer generation like myself, uh, tick identification was easy. This was the tick we grew up with. There were no other ticks. We didn't have deer ticks or Lone Star or other things. Um, so this is kind of easy to identify even though there are other species. So on the far right, that's an adult male. And they have dark brown coloring and these creamy beige lines. We don't worry so much about the male, adult male ticks because they basically don't feed. It's these um, female ticks, the adult female. So again, she has this creamy, um, bright, wide spot here, and that makes it pretty easy to distinguish from other ticks. This is a new player on Cape Cod. This is the Lone Star tick, and the adult male on the far left, that's pretty easy. It's basically all black. Um, that adult female, very characteristic, that bright white spot on the middle of her back. The other way to distinguish these ticks from other ticks is that relative speed. These guys can run. So unlike the ticks we're used to encountering, they kind of slow and lumber along, these guys are like little race cars. And this thing has been moving northward for some time now. Um, a lot of ecologists, including myself, think this is a function of climate change. We're seeing plants and animals where we never used to see them before. And up until, say, 2012, the northernmost points of detected populations was really on the islands of Nashon, Cuttyhunk, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. But in that year, 2012, I was called out to Sandy Neck Beach Park. That's a six mile long peninsula. It's basically a barrier beach. And they were seeing some different kind of tick and they weren't sure what was going on here. So I went out and looked and I found Lone Star tick from one end of that place to the other. So they basically own that piece of real estate. And so that suggests to me that it's been on that peninsula for some time, we don't know how long. And in fall of 2017, I was called out to West Falmouth, the Shining Sea Bike Trail. I found another established population out there. So this thing has been found now in different parts of the Cape. Um, it basically is quite happy here. And we have a separate segment on Lone Star Tick and we'll talk more about uh, the ecological reasons for, for their presence. Now here's the deer tick family portrait. Um, the proper name or more accurate name for this tick is really the black-legged tick, and we'll get to some reasons for that in a minute. On the far right, that's an adult female. So basically the head area is basically shiny black and the very characteristic bright red abdomen. Uh, again, the males are very dark, um, almost black, and again, we don't worry about the adult males. Now, the immature stages, the nymphs and the larvae, um, they're kind of hard to identify by the naked eye. Um, if you have a very small tick on you during the summer months, just by virtue of population size of deer ticks versus other ticks, it's likely to be a deer tick, but the best way to do is send it in for me to put it under a microscope and I can identify it in a couple seconds. Now, the relative size of these ticks is something we try and give people in an analogy using bagel toppings. Just how large is an adult stage deer tick? How large is a nymph stage tick? Well, that adult stage tick, they're about the size of a sesame seed. So they're fairly large, readily seen, uh, but that nymph stage tick is the size of a poppy seed. So something the size of a poppy seed with eight legs, a bad attitude, and can plant you on your behind for a long time. Now, why the name deer tick is a misnomer. This thing has been documented to be associated with 125 different vertebrate hosts. So it's not just about deer, it's not just about mice. This is a very complex ecosystem. There's a lot of moving parts. The rodents are very important here. Um, the mice, the chipmunks, the squirrels, the rats, they're what we call competent hosts. And what we mean by competency is that these animals have the ability to harbor the Lyme disease bacteria and transmit it back into the tick population. So it's kind of like microbial ping pong. Uh, birds play a role in a couple different ways. 
we already talked about birds as you know being able to move ticks around great distances but there are some birds that are res reservoir hosts for this Lyme disease bacteria including songbirds like our American robin and our good old friend the wild turkey. Then we've got a bunch of creatures, they're incompetent hosts, okay? The deer, the raccoons, the coyotes, they cannot infect a tick, okay? Um, that's, that's a misunderstanding, okay? It's just bad information. But what they can do is supply blood meal and keep that tick population rolling along. The winters, okay? I get calls from people all the time, including the media, Larry, we had a harsh winter. What did that do to the tick population? And I tell them my answer is the same as last year and the year before. It did absolutely nothing. And winters here in Cape Cod are really all that harsh? No, it's a matter of perspective. Uh, when I worked in the cranberry industry, I spent 24 years traveling to Wisconsin where I was known by the name Misha. Now Wisconsin has real winters. 25 below zero for extended periods of time is not all that unusual. And in Wisconsin, deer ticks are very healthy, and Wisconsin's quite endemic for Lyme disease. And the reason for this is very fascinating. Ticks synthesize a chemical called glycerol. Well, what the heck is glycerol? Well, these things make antifreeze, okay? So ticks have adapted over millions of years. They've seen it all. They've lived through the Ice Age. And the way this glycerol works is it prevents ice crystal formation in cells. So if you have an ice crystal form in a cell, it punctures the cell wall. Whatever's inside the cell leaks out of the cell. That's not good. And they also discovered that Lyme disease bacteria feeds on the glycerol as a source of energy for itself. So this is one perfectly engineered little package. Quite fascinating from a scientific standpoint. Tick habitat. Yeah, tall grass, especially if it's under tree canopy, so shade, higher humidity, lower temperatures, that is absolutely perfect tick habitat. But also, if you look around your house, okay, um, surveillance research at Connecticut Ag Experiment Station uh, demonstrated that two-thirds of the people that sent ticks into them for identification and testing got them from outdoor yard activities. So things like ticks and gardening go hand in hand. And so for deer ticks, you're not gonna find them out in an open lawn, okay? Short grass, direct sunlight, higher temperatures, that's just a hostile environment for ticks. But you get to a transition zone, so the edge of the yard that might be in partial shade, and that transitions to bushes, trees, leaf litter, lower temperatures, higher humidities, that's where you're gonna find the ticks. But if you think about that, woody ornamental plantings around the sides of your house, that's tick habitat as well, so you have to be careful of that. So here's my contact information. I'm always open for business, look forward to your calls or answering your emails, and we would like to thank Cape Cod Healthcare for their generous support of this project. <laughs>